All right. Thank you all for joining us. Um, as you may know, immediately following this panel, we have a performance from Yo-Yo Ma over lunch, which we're very excited about. But I, for one, and I hope you are as well, equally excited, if not more excited, about this panel. Uh, the topic of this panel is going to be on AI's impact on economic inequality in class, and we have some excellent speakers here to, to, to share their thoughts with you today. My name is Johnny Penn. I'm going to be the host. I'm an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University and a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge, and I'm also the uh, project development lead on the history of, AI, history of AI project at the Center for the Future of Intelligence in Cambridge. Oh, I just had a stroke. Um, <laughs> Um, so just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to do, we're going to have a format, this, the format will be 30 minutes, uh, our speakers will share with you their thoughts on this topic and we'll walk through a couple questions and have them speak to each other, ideally. And then we're going to open the floor to you for 30 minutes to share your thoughts on, uh, on this, to or to ask questions about this topic. Now it may not need to be said, but I'm going to say it anyways, that we are in a point now of historic inequality. Uh, two-thirds of the world's wealth, 1% uh, of the global population is on track to have two-thirds of the world's wealth by 2030. And the ways that this trickles down into real harm, to, to, to people dying, to people in, in, in misery, um, is, is hard to quantify, it's hard to even express sometimes. And is, I think we need to constantly remind ourselves of the world, uh, the amount of inequality that we are suffering through now. To give you just a, a quick example, in Nova Scotia, we learned this week 600 uh, em employees at a call center were uh, fired just before Christmas, including one man, Justin, who had been there for 14 and a half years and was sent back to his two kids, unable to pay his electrical bills, and had to tell his two kids that they would not only not be able to pay for electricity, but not be able to be able to pay for rent as well. This is not going to. This is not a unique situation. This is going to be happening more and more as this next wave of automation takes off. And so we collectively have to think through what we're going to do to deal with that. To give you a brief introduction to our speakers, and we have one final speaker who's going to join us. Uh, her flight is slightly delayed, but she will rush up onto the stage and and and, and speak to you. The first joining from Los Angeles, California. Can we hear you, Safia? Can you, you hear me? Yes, fantastic. Okay. You, you're, the, you're the position of kind of God speaking to the rest of us here. This is not the position I want to be yeah. in. <laughs> um, Dr. Safia um, Umja Noble, I'm sorry, I've got pronunciation wrong, is the assistant professor at the University of Southern California's Annenberg School of Communication and the author of the best selling and incredible book, uh, Algorithms of Oppression How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. And uh, uh, Dr. Noble's research focuses on racist and sexist algorithmic bias in commercial search engines, and I encourage you to follow her on Twitter uh, and to read her work, but also to follow her on Twitter right now. Um, <laughs> next we have here beside me John Havens, who is executive director of the IEEE's Global Initiative on the Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems, which has two primary outputs. The first is the creation and iteration of a body of work known as, the ethically, al known as ethically Aligned Design, a vision for prioritizing human well-being with autonomous and intelligent systems, and the identification and recommendation of ideas for standards projects focused on prioritizing ethical considerations in such systems. You can follow John on Twitter as well. We have a surprise addition to this panel, uh, which is Dr. Christina Kolkloff, who is the Director for the Future of Work at Uni Global Union. Uni Global Union uh, represents 650 unions worldwide, um, and, and I'm very glad to have a union voice on this panel. And the final speaker who will be joining us from the airport, she's racing here now from there, uh, is Dr. Ifioma Ajunwa, who is Assistant Professor at Cornell University's Industrial and Labor Relations School, Associated Faculty Member at Cornell Law School, Faculty Associate at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard Law School. And uh, Dr. Ajunwa's research interests lie at the intersection of law and technology with a particular focus on organizational behavior and the ethical governance of workplace technology. So, one thing I would love to accomplish in this panel is to be plain spoken about the situation we're in and to not, uh, uh, to, to not need to feel that you need to hold back your emotions in any way because I think there's reason to be incensed with uh, the situation we're in, but I, I would I'd be like to hear your opinion. So to start us off, John, I guess you travel the world talking to engineers of many different kind of technical backgrounds. What do you see as the responsibilities that engineers have in this, in this position? None at all. Okay. <laughs> just kidding. Um, so first I should say, just to be um, outspoken or what have you, uh, the views I'm sharing today, just to be disclaimer-ish, 
uh, are mine, are John's, and don't necessarily represent IEEE, and that way I can speak more openly. Uh, the work that we're doing is actually all about complementing engineers. IEEE is the world's largest technology association. It's the heart of the global engineering community, created by Thomas Edison about 130 years ago. It's in 160 countries with over half a million members. So first of all, I am honored to be working with engineers. I am not an engineer. And the joke I've been making with my philosopher and marketing friends uh, in the last three years or so of this work has been, who do you want building your elevator? The engineers or the ethicists? As a rule, the engineers. But then the metaphor, which may be too forced, is you want the ethicists and everyone else along for the ride. Um, yeah, it's pretty bad, but it's, it's early, forgive me. Um, I think the thing about responsibility is also a, to sort of turn that question around and say, how can we help in the sense of, I think it's unfair that engineers, you know, when you're not necessarily, and, and it's, it's hard to talk about engineers, it's like one small group, right? It's such a vast realm. But to say, you're responsible for everything that happens with X product, when the, the product that's released downstream may be something you don't touch in certain manifestations earlier on. So our focus, and again, sponsored by or helped, uh, supported by IEEE, is to complement the work of, that engineers have done since the time of the aqueducts earlier. And say, along with uh, things like focusing on harm uh, and focusing on decreasing unintended consequences, how can you also ask other questions about the values of the end users who are using the products? Um, and this also affects market decisions. Um, anyway, that's a kind of boring way to start, but that's, that's my first answer. Thank you, John. And I'm just going to uh, big up John's book, Artificial Intelligence, Heart, as in heart. Um, it's available on Amazon now if you're interested. So, Professor Noble, to move to you, what do you think artificial intelligence, how do you, how do you characterize the impact that artificial intelligence as a suite of technologies will have on uh, class and uh, economic inequality? Well, first of all, I want to say I'm also really uh, just honored to have an opportunity to join this panel and to speak to you, all of you. And I have so much respect for the work of engineers, even though sometimes maybe I'm not characterized as such. Um, I think that the decisions, as John said, that engineers are engaged in, in terms of automating a whole host of decisions and outcomes are incredibly important and of course they're playing a role in the organization of our economy. Um, you know, we can look at, for example, one of the things I try to do in my book is gather enough evidence and examples to show how there are kind of a whole host of ways and contexts and histories and communities within which digital technologies are operating. And in some cases, they're really exacerbating um, social inequality, certainly at a level of whether it's misrepresenting people, um, in, ensnaring people into um, systems that maybe they don't want to be the targets of, uh, not giving people a way out of some of these systems. And I'll give you an example. You know, one of the things that I've been concerned about and kind of been tracking are the ways that old patterns of discrimination um, become the data sets upon which uh, machines are trained and technologies are based, uh, digital technologies and the way they're deployed. And so, for example, if you look at for, for so many years, women and girls, um, their identities have been uh, sexually exploited. Women and girls uh, often find themselves characterized as sexual objects in search engines. Um, that's not new to the internet, although the internet certainly amplifies these kinds of ideas about women and girls, and that, of course, becomes worse when you are a woman or a girl of color. Um, there are all, also all kinds of new technologies, and here I'm in Los Angeles, which is one of the epicenters of technologies like predictive policing, for, for example, and we see um, you know, again, and the kinds of histories of over-policing communities of color, over-policing poor people, um, and these become the data sets that serve as a baseline, for example, in predicting who future criminals will be. And I find this really interesting that, um, you know, the context within which we think about crime and criminality is one that is deeply racialized in this country. 
Um, for example, you don't see predictive policing technologies facing Wall Street. And some of us might say that would be a really important place to look and see where um, criminality is going down. And of course, if we had had those kinds of technologies maybe facing other sectors of our um, economy and of our society, we might have predicted uh, that um, Wall Street bankers would be engaged in the worst um, financial crisis of, you know, of my life, certainly in modern history, which was the mortgage crisis of 2006, wherein we had the largest transfer of wealth from black communities back to the hands of white communities in the United States and the, the largest wipeout of black wealth in the history of the United States. So effectively, all of the gains of the civil rights movement all the way back to Reconstruction were destroyed uh, during that crisis. And that was really an automated you know, financialization and gamification of the markets um, series of processes that were implicated in that. And those are the kinds of things that I think are really important. Um, you know, I've often taught computer science students and actuarial science students, and when I try to teach them, for example, the history of redlining and how redlining is implicated, they need to understand this history and how that might get recreated in the digital systems. I've had actuarial science students say to me, why do I need to know about this? They really don't understand the, how these data sets and how these previous histories become a baseline for the kinds of financial modeling that they're doing in the future. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's so important that social scientists and engineers are in communication. Thank you very much. And again, we're going to open the floor to questions if any of you guys want to follow up on individual ideas that have come up. I'm very glad to have uh, uh, our final panelist with us, Dr. Ifioma Ajunwa. Now, you're an expert in the history of labor relations and I wonder if you could help us understand how this moment in time, characterize this moment of time in the kind of passing of history. What's unique about this moment? Uh, and what, has, what sort of trends have been building? Um, Does that work? This, we could pass you one? There we go. Um, uh, that, that's a really great question, right? Because it's, you know, as um, Sophia was noting, you know, um, a lot of these things that we're seeing now were things that were set in motion in the past. And it's really all about how automation has exacerbated their effects. And I think the same is true in labor relations. Um, so when you look at things like, for example, hiring algorithms, um, they're really operating on age-old stereotypes, age-old um, racial categorizations and age-old uh, racial hierarchies that were already set in place. Um, the difference, of course, is that they can operate at a velocity and a volume that's much different than any one human manager, right? Um, so the effects are much, much more impactful, uh, much, much more widespread, and can also become much more entrenched because uh, of the sort of aura of um, impartiality and objectivity that we um, impart to machines, right? Um, and because of that, the results may go unquestioned um, versus when um, a human manager is uh, returning results that might seem biased, then there's more likely to be a question of, oh, why is it that you know, we haven't hired any people of color or we haven't hired any women? versus when a machine is returning the results, I feel that as a society, we kind of have a tendency to be too trusting that the machine knows it all or that the machine is somehow removed from the history of uh, racialization, um, particularly, I think, in the United States. Um, so I think that is something that I am really trying to bring to the forefront in terms of labor relations, um, just thinking through how the use of machines in the workplace, um, which may be seen as progressive or innovative, may nonetheless be reinforcing um, inequalities or creating new ones. So John, you wanted to respond to that? Oh, sure. Can I go right back? Are we able to get the rest of these mics go up, please? Yeah, John, do you want to respond? Sure. By the way, nice to meet you. I'm glad your, your flight came. Oh, she's um, I just want to say thank you, Sophia. It's such a pleasure to meet you, at least uh, virtually, um, as God. It's nice to meet God. Um, and uh, some of the stuff you said, I wanted to, I guess, take it maybe in a different direction, but to comment on the mortgage crisis. Uh, 
So again, I'm speaking as John. So technically, I'm a consultant. I was an actor for about 15 years in New York. Okay. I've always lived as a consultant and as an American. Where health insurance is not guaranteed, I have kids. Um, the average amount of debt that most Americans will face when they leave college is $30,000 if they're lucky. And what I didn't understand after the mortgage crisis ended was how no one was punished. And I'm not interested in being condemnatory for the sake of being condemnatory. I'm not, you know, like angry about those people should be punished in the sense of politics. And I'm not interested in talking Republican versus Democrat or what have you or anything about any administration. I just don't understand um, what I do, why people weren't punished. What I do understand what I'm living and so many of my friends are living is one medical bill, one for $5,000 can ruin many people I know. And I don't mean ruin like, oh, tough year this year. Can't buy, you know, certain type of clothes at Christmas. I mean move your house. How many people have friends, and if I'm alone, I am shocked. Maybe it's because we're in Canada. How many friends over the course of the mortgage crisis had con discussions with their friends and family where they said, in one fell swoop, in one week, we lost half of our retirement savings. And those are people who even had access to things like 401ks, <laughs> or when you leave a job to actually even have the phrase severance package. I wanna be very conscious of the fact and, be, and say with as much honor and respect as I can to Sophia and to my fellow pan, what's your name? Ifoma. I'm also keenly aware that I'm a 49 year old white guy. I have more privileges than most people on the planet. So I wanna be very clear about my bias. Nonetheless, as a father with two kids, living right now in a place where two things I don't understand. One, if people don't get punished when they premeditatively break the law, then kind of all bets are off with fully understanding how to build anything, let alone AI, which is so you know, easy to help wonderfully with things like statistical modeling or whatever else. But I'm also glad that Sophia brought up the fact that a lot of the basis for automation in terms of how things can harm us sadly have started with the primary way that people gauge value on the planet still, which is basically exponential growth through GDP. GDP is not evil, but it's one very myopic set of things to measure about value or values. It's productivity and growth. The other thing I'll mention quickly, we can go on a separate talk if you want, um, is tax evasion. Sexy to talk about on an AI for good panel. But tax evasion means that whatever organization wants to do it, billions, sometimes trillions of dollars just moves money kind of from left to right. Is it legal? Yes. Is it ethical? Not at all. <laughs> And by the time you want to talk about the money that we'll make doing this and that and all these other great stuff, awesome, making money, cool. But when you are able to move billions and trillions of dollars around, and then again, the middle and lower class from any background continues to suffer, then AI for good becomes a strange sort of phrase. I keep saying it's actually AI for goods with an S because the focus is on product and productivity. It is not on the environment. Or building purpose. Thank you, John. So, Sefia, I want to respond, or I would love for you to pick up on this in just a sec, but first, um, uh, Dr. Kokloff, if you would introduce for us how, what role do unions play in this? We've seen that Google had this, you know, 20,000 person walkout that, that affected real change, and so people that are at these big companies now can affect real change, but what is your position as a unionist on, on this topic? Well, first of all, <laughs> No, first of all, I really want to thank all of you in this room for being here. I realize that AI for social good is maybe not a typical topic of this Congress, but to see so many of you here, that's great. So what are unions doing? Some would say hopefully nothing. Some would say that unions were bracket in history. We have our heydays and that's it. But I think the search for the collectiveness, the search of the awareness now that something is a shift, something, something's wrong. I want to ask all of you in this room, who in here has a job in a company? How many of you are a worker? 
Now, it's funny, there's much fewer workers than there are people in a company. And this is precisely the problem. We have been taught to believe we are something different than a worker. But you are workers. Every single one of you who has a job in a company, you are a worker. Even those of you who also might drive an Uber, or might be a contractual worker, or might be forced to be self-employed or on a zero-hour contract. You are workers. And one of the problems of our times is we've come to believe we're something different than that. Or as a young woman in Sao Paulo said to me a couple of weeks ago when I gave a speech there, she said, I know what's wrong with unions. And I said, what? I said, you are for the workers, but nobody is a worker anymore. And I think this is something we have to consider when we're talking about technology. Of all of you who claimed you did work in a company, how many of you have access to the data that the company has on you? Two, three. This just goes to show the information asymmetry at the moment is putting us as workers, and 99% of you in this room are workers, in a position of disadvantage. How are we supposed to negotiate the algorithm? if we don't have access to the same information, the same data that the corporations have. So what role do the unions have? Well, one of these is one of the ones I'm working hardly on across the world, is how do we get access to this data? How do we start putting demands to what data they are allowed to log on us? I have read many multinational companies' data policies. They want to log <coughs> people's gender sexuality, uh, why? Trade union membership is specifically mentioned, why? And I think this is where we have to start reflecting, where, why am I in a position of information asymmetry in a world that is supposed to be giving us equal access to information, the free internet? So this is why we're seeing, I think, Johnny, to answer your question, this rising up war of people. We don't need a traditional union necessarily to run that. I get enthused by the collectives that are being built. And nobody should have said that solidarity is dead. We will, and all of you in this room who are workers, you will reclaim your position. Thank you, all of you. So, Safia, you know, you're involved in, this, in the AI community. You've seen the spread of kind of AI ethics as a, as a, as a way to respond to some of the excesses of the system in which this technology or this kind of science is embedded. How do you characterize the winners and losers? And, and how do you characterize AI ethics as a kind of solution to these, some of these problems? Well, I just want to say I really appreciate the last two comments so, so much. And, um, you know, we could have a whole conference that was just about these conversations rather than a short hour. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's, that's interesting to me, uh, especially kind of building off the last couple of comments, is the way in which we've come to characterize uh, ourselves and the users of the internet. So one of the things we know, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm super old. I was on the internet before there was a graphic user interface, before Netscape, before AOL, when we were in BBSs. So I've been around for a minute. and. You know, in early internet culture, as, as utopian as it uh, was imagined, and we can certainly take up some crit critiques of that, um, we thought of ourselves as netizens in a different way. You know, we thought of ourselves as kind of organizing around a whole host of interests. And of course, now how people who use the internet are thought of as users, um, consumers, and commodities, data objects to be commodified by platforms. And um, that's, of course, you know, a, a, a one way of thinking about um, what digital technologies could do, what they could provide. It could have been different, quite frankly. And for those of us who've been around for a long time, we know that there are lots of different ways we could have gone rather than the full-blown commercial internet. Um, you know, and, and I think that what we've seen is that the internet has just become another site for organizing capital and extracting um, you know, resource or extracting value out of human beings. And of course, it's done this in some of the most egregious ways. And we're reading about that in the headlines all of the time. So I think these are the kinds of things that um, 
are starting to be taken up by people who talk about, for example, ethics in AI. And of course, we're in a panel here called AI for Social Good. And one of the things that I try to just, you know, I, I appreciate that we are foregrounding ethics. I do think it's a very narrow conception of the problems. Um, it centers the technology still, as if perfecting the technology, this kind of techno-deterministic impulse that people just seem to not be able to resist, um, that if we could just make a more perfect, more ethical, less discriminatory algorithm or, or AI, then our problems would be solved. But these problems are not going to be solved through technical solutions. And like the previous speaker, I think they're going to, uh, has, has said so beautifully, um, we need to be thinking about how we want our society to be organized and in whose interests. And what we're wit witnessing is the use of kind of the financialized, informationalized, um, datafied markets um, and processes that are becoming more and more opaque um, to see massive transfers of wealth. I mean, we've seen the greatest transfers of wealth from working people to the 1% over the last 10 years. Um, and we could even say maybe since the 1970s, um, uh, kind of under the auspices of neoliberal social and economic, po economic policy. And, um, and, you know, people just think they're kind of playing with an app or making an app or, you know, I mean, there's um, a lot at stake in the making of these kinds of gamified systems that obscure in many ways and also acculturate us to things like a gig economy as if we would want to spend our lives in precarity, in precarity driving Uber um, or doing some other type of gig work where um, we should be grateful to have, you know, um, car lords, I don't know, I think of that as like kind of the landlords, the people who we can own, who own the cars that we lease so that we can drive and, you know, um, not have health care, right? Um, or not have an eight hour work um, day and not have benefits that organized labor helped us to achieve. And they get glorified as like something new and innovative and those are the discourses, creativity, gig, innovative. Um, and I think we got to press pause on that and double click on that and say, wait a minute, that's what's happening is a, a rollback of labor rights, a, a rollback of worker security, a, a rollback of, of, of any type of access to the middle class. I mean, my grandparents did better than my husband and I are doing in terms of real net wealth. Um, how can that be? I mean, my, my grandparents were working blue collar workers and my husband and I are white collar workers and we can barely live in LA. Uh, so we have to look at like these things, I think, Johnny, that you opened us up with, which is um, the transfer of wealth, the consolidation of power uh, in the hands of the elites, and what our active role will be in either resisting that, um, like workers at Google, like workers at Microsoft are attempting to do and saying, like, we won't go any further than this line. We won't cross this line, but also understanding the, the work that they make in the world and how that's either accelerating these problems or um, or intervening upon and disrupting. Thank you very much. So, if you I have one question for you, and then I'm going to open the floor to, to the audience. I'm curious about like to what extent is this really about AI? Because this seems like a bigger problem. So, is it really fair to to put the pressure on you know those of us in the AI community to deal with this? And the other part of this is, you know, I've got a, a laptop and I use Amazon and I, I have things that capitalism gives me that I really like. So. When we talk about this, are we talking about overthrowing capital? I, I don't know, you know, how do you characterize the strategic kind of way we in this community can engage with the parts that are most relevant to this community? Wow, those are weighty, weighty questions. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll start by first reiterating really what Sophia mentioned, which is, you know, this idea of techno-determinism um, and what I see as the perils of techno-solutionism which is that technology is a solution to the problem of technology. Um, and that's framing the problem, as, as you know, Sophia so eloquently put it, quite narrowly. Um, the problem isn't just the technology. The problem is um, the belief systems, the ethos, 
that went into the design of the technology. The problem is the design of our society and why we think such technology is needed in the first place. So I, I really do want to stress that techno solutionism can't be the only answer. Um, we really have to look further. Um, and then I also wanted to touch upon the idea of, of um, ethics in AI. Um, you know, there's been an upswell, right, of um, people clamoring for more ethics in terms of how, um, you know, people like you do your work, you know, how engineers and developers are, you know, look at products that they're working on. And then there's also been a subsequent sort of backlash in terms of people thinking, well, is that putting too much on the workers, right? Because at the end of the day, I think there's a realization that the workers in the company only have so much say in the end product, right? They are giving uh, marching orders and they're constrained to those mar marching orders. So even if you have the most ethical engineer, the most ethical software developer, they're still constrained by their organizational structure. Um, so that I think really um, tells us that ethics can't also be the only solution. Um, and I'm for ethics. I, I teach ethics and technology uh, at Cornell and I really do think that ethical uh, curriculum and ethical training should be like a required part of any um, professional training. You shouldn't be something that's discretionary or um, something that's more of an elective as it is in many places currently. Um, all that being said, however, as a lawyer, I want more laws. <laughs> I want something with teeth. Um, the problem, you know, at the end of the day is that a lot of ethics, for most people, it feels like, you know, it's something I can add on or take or leave it. Whereas laws, right, with real consequences, real criminal penalties or um, mon monetary liabilities um, would have teeth. So I really think that we want laws to protect workers, for example. Um, I think some existing laws can be read to protect workers, even in the light of new technological developments, like for example, hiring algorithms. Um, there are some consumer laws that could be read to protect workers who uh, make use of them. But that being said, I also think that some of the laws, you know, they didn't envision the current technologies when they were being promulgated. So that does mean that we do need to rethink some of the laws. Um, and it might not be rewriting the laws, but perhaps rethinking their application, um, rethinking burdens of proof, et cetera. Um, so I guess that's my long-winded answer to your question. Um, as to whether, you know, this is really just about technology or, or capitalism in of itself, um, I think that's a broader question that we still want to ask, right? We still, we don't want to just say, oh, this is a bad algorithm, let's just create another one. We should ask, oh, well, why was this a bad algorithm? Why was this not a solution to a problem? What, why, why is a problem existing in the first place? And I think this is especially th true when you have algorithms that have socioeconomic impact, right? Like hiring algorithms, for example. Um, you know, you had the recent snafu with Amazon and its hiring algorithm that seemed to, um, you know, be biased against women because of certain characteristics that have been written into the algorithm. But then the question, she didn't just be, let's scrap that algorithm and hide it and never tell anyone about it and create a new one. The question would be, why don't women have those characteristics that we've written into? Why do we think those characteristics are important for a job in our workplace? And are they really important for a job in our workplace? So I think there really should be those broader questions being asked. Thank you. So if you want to line up uh, and ask questions, we have microphones here and I think, yeah, back there as well. But John, do you want to respond quickly? Yes. To Fioma? I so appreciate what you just said. Um, I might ask you to keep your remarks short if you don't mind, just so we have time for questions. Everyone tells me that for some reason. <laughs> um, good means nothing unless you define what that good is, right? So when someone says my intentions are good, gr great. I'm glad they're not evil, but what are you building for? So a positive future, the reason we talk about human and uh, environmental well-being in our work is there are ways that you can say, 
when the environment is not suffering and it's flourishing and there's enough water say in Johannesburg for the next hundred years, that's the, the UN SDGs are great things to say these are models of success. Same thing we haven't talked about mental health. If you know the idea of triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit, profit doesn't go away. And this is one thing I want to make the point of saying it's not about being anti-corporate. It's about recognizing that people also work at corporations. But if you don't say triple bottom line is what good is, then whatever you build will still be built on top of neoliberalism, classical ways of deeming what something is success. The five words, this is my last thing, don't worry, Johnny. The five words that I say are actually going to kill humanity are not something like evil robots or corporations. It's these five words, did we make our numbers? At the end of every quarter, that is what is actually driving humanity. That is not good or bad. It just is. So laws that exist, awesome, couldn't agree more, GDPR, human rights we haven't talked about, as well as being, they're the bedrock for what ethics should be built on. But unless we change the fundamental aspects of what our key performance indicators are, we will always be slaves to the bottom line. Thanks, John. So I take out of that, that that this is something that we have to do collectively. And by talking about AI for social good, sometimes that can mask another conversation that could be had about a system that we all buy into and, buy, and benefit from but can also change. Okay, first, uh, first question uh, here. So I'm glad that there's union perspective on this panel because I think that's going to be very important going forward. And unions have long been focused on fair paying, safe jobs for people. And by extension of that, what they're really doing is giving people access to health care, education, and lodging, which is what they get from the income. I wonder in the future if unions are going to have to evolve rather than focusing on maintaining jobs and move towards to advocating for UBI and universal health care and things like that. How do you see unions evolving in the future to not necessarily fight for jobs, but perhaps fight for the well-being of workers or soon to be maybe not workers? Thank you. And I'm going to ask, if you don't mind, keep our question or answer short just so we can get through as many people as we can. No, I just, <clears throat> just want to say, excellent question. We are evolving in that way. I just personally, I am not a fan of the UBI. I think it's a scapegoat. I think it's way too easy for people to say, oh, we just get rid of all the jobs and give people UBI. We work for many other reasons than, than just to earn the money. We are moving strongly into the direction of also pushing for, as John was talking about, measuring well-being. How can we promote well-being as an index of success rather than profit? We're also working the TUC in England, the three-day weekend. So we're changing a lot of that, but I think you're right in questioning this. And one of the things that I'm working on right now is actually a way to electronically and virtually reach out to the members, also the unusual suspects, and actually hear what, sh what is the main priority. Is it pay? Is it mental well-being? Is it the three-day weekend? So really, in that way, engage broadly and as, as much as possible. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. Uh, yeah, back there. First question. Uh, thank you. I'm not Thank sure we you can hear you. Okay, yeah. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jared Moore. I'm from the Wadwani Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And I'm going to ask you, sorry, to speak really loud. Uh, I, I think really deeply about these issues. I just taught an ethics class to computer scientists at the University of Washington this past winter. I, I guess my question is, I mean, we talk about computer science ethics, and, and I'm going to focus on that issue because this is a room of technologists. I mean, that, that's kind of the lever that we can pull here. It's not really policy to the, to the degree we might desire. And... I wonder about the normative lens that we're using, you know, what ethics, what is the valence? Um, and so I, I'd ask all of the, the panelists maybe to speak a little bit to that, and, and particularly to ask, you know, what's the call to action? You know, we're not going to implement policy changes necessarily at the moment. This is a lot of people that care about AI and social good. You know, how do we drive the conversations? Um, how do we implement the classes at the university, in particular, if, you know, ABET is, you know, striking ethics guidelines um, from their accreditation? Um, right. It's a bit of a long question, but I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Sophia, can I ask for your opinion on that? Well, I think it's a great question. And, of course, you know, I spent my first 15 years in corporate America, so I just want to say that I know what it's like to work in a company every day and have uh, responsibilities and goals that you have to accomplish. Um, so what is the call to action? What are things that you can do in the room? Because of course, what we're talking about are big issues of structural inequality and uh, the ways that public policy dictates that. And of course, those are big issues we have to work on together. But we also want to figure out what can we do in our everyday. So one of the things I think immediately coming out of this session 
is you can organize reading groups and there's a whole host of us who are writing books, including people who are writing papers on this panel and uh, people that we work with and collaborate mm -hmm. with. And you can start reading immediately because I think we certainly want to see um, you know, this kind of lifelong learning commitment and we maybe even re-education or deeper education into some of these conversations that I don't even think we can do justice to in an hour. But we have great reading lists of things and of course many of us would come and have conversations in companies and start thinking through the nuances so that in your own kind of mental logics of thinking through your work, you might ask different questions, which is of course what, you know, in my work, I write, you know, I wrote a book about Google in essence and Yelp, um, but I was bringing to it different questions. Many people have written about Google and are writing about digital platforms, but they weren't necessarily thinking about it from the perspective of those who are most vulnerable or who have the least amount of power in um, pushing back on some of these company decisions. Um, so you'll ask different questions if you put yourself into different conversations. And I think that will also lead to different kinds of uh, products or, again, limits that you might uh, impose on yourselves. Um, you know, it's that Oppenheimer effect, and I, you know, I'm sure John can speak to this as a historian and uh, of technology um, better than I. But you know, uh, many of the people who worked on the, uh, you know, worked on some of the most state-of-the-art modern weapons um, that we're that we're dealing with now, um, pu purely pursued those as scientific exploits and left it to policymakers to deal with the repercussions of that. But what would it have been like if um, engineers themselves had said, you know what, autonomous weapons, too far. We don't want to participate in the making uh, of. Um, so there are things, I mean, it's, technologists don't have to abdicate their own moral compass and can certainly engage with the kinds of evidence gathering that we're all trying to do to support you in that. So, yeah. So the, yeah. Yeah. Just really quick, just because I have to pitch, but it's free. We have 14 standards working groups where those discussions you just talked about, we need you, engineers and technologists. They're free to join. You don't have to join IEEE. Standards form the basis for policy and law. So please join that work. We need people in this room. I really like to, thank you, John. A comment, Sophia, you made about the transatlantic slave trade emerging simultaneously to the Enlightenment, that if we just focus on the good, we may ignore that there's a lot of harm being happening simultaneously. So in fairness, we've had two men uh, ask questions. If it's all right, I might have you uh, ask our next question, just so we have some, yeah. How appropriate, because um, <laughs> I, um, so I kind of, my question is kind of going back to the beginning of the talk when we were talking about uh, bias. Um, I am, you know, from the U.S., and of course, Silicon Valley has a serious diversity problem. And um, so we were talking about biases that are in the data set. Um, I kind of want to talk about the biases that may come with the engineers and the developers. You know, 65% of Silicon Valley is white men. Um, and in Silicon Valley, a woman actually means a white woman due to the fact that less than 10% of the women are women of color. So my question is, considering that uh, implicit bias obviously is happening within organizations and also within the rooms where things are being developed, do, does the panel think that diversifying the workforce and the workers, the developers, uh, could have a positive impact on the decrease of some of the biases that we see in the products that are being developed? And, um, and maybe talk to uh, possible solutions that uh, that we could do. Thank you. If you want to, and Christina, maybe if you want to first. You need a microphone. Sorry. Um, that, that's really an excellent question, and and I, I absolutely agree that you know diversity um, in Silicon Valley is a problem, and and of course you know the viewpoints and the the um, subjectivity of whoever is developing a product will necessarily dictate how that product functions, what features are considered important. Um, and this is not just for racial diversity, this is also for uh, new, neurodiversity, this is also for people with disabilities, et cetera. Um, but I, I wanna push back a little. Like, while I, I agree for sure um, that worker diversity is important, 
I actually think much more important is leadership diversity. Because I think a lot of times when we talk about diversity in Silicon Valley, we're focused on the engineers, we're focused on the workers. Um, but I actually think that given the, the structure of power in organizations, diversity in the C-suite is actually more important. And I think we really haven't scratched the surface of that because there's even much less diversity when you get um, uh, you know, into the higher echelons of, of Silicon Valley. Um, so I think we really need to keep that in mind and consider that that's also a problem. Thanks, Christina, do you wanna make a quick comment? Yeah, very, very quickly on that, I really want, where did you go, you who asked the question? <laughs> All right, yeah, no, I like, I, I like being able to see. No, I think it's excellent, excellent question. I agree so much on this. We mustn't put so much responsibility on the workers all the time. But for those of you who, in, who do develop in this room, and this leads back to a discussion we had uh, at a panel on, uh, earlier this week. Every time you produce something, every time you're working on something, get a group of diverse people to discuss it with you. Get your friends who are philosophers, who are priests, who are teachers, who are doctors, who are you know, nurses, whatever. My priest friends are always busy. They're yeah. Always <laughs> Get them, you know, talk to them about it. Get their angles, do a 360 on this and check for any of the unintended consequences of what you're doing and how then you could discuss this. And then get your leadership, I really appreciate that, to do the same. Okay, I'm sorry, we're gonna go to one in the back and then we'll come back to you. You'll get your question, don't worry. Uh, hi, uh, thank you so much for the panel. Uh, I was just really uh, wondering, kind of coming back, John, to your point about performance indicators. So the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals have developed a very uh, extensive fr framework of indicators and I was wondering uh, how could this community really help contribute to using AI for developing better uh, indicators, but really also acknowledging some of the challenges, including like how AI tools are not equally distributed around the world, and how um, maybe they're really like the sort of uh, surveillance that often happens, often happens with collecting data, like really how do we uh, think about agency, and so that these sort of indicators are uh, going to be contributing to a more sustainable future versus exacerbating differences, and if you have some insights on that. Thank you, yeah. John, yeah, do you want to talk about your work and maybe just for, who in the room is familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals? Just show of hands. Okay, just because not everybody is, could you want to describe a bit of what they are and how, what you guys are working on? I'll do my best, I won't give them due shrift, uh, but uh, the United Nations has 17 Sustainable Development Goals that by 2030, if they're achieved, can have a pronounced positive effect unilaterally, holistically around the world, meaning not just for one sector or people, but also the environment. Um, so I lead work at um, IEEE, there's a, one of our standards, it's called 7010, would love to get you involved. The whole idea of the standard is to both educate engineers, data scientists, programmers who may not know about the UN SDGs and indicators beyond GDP, and then teach people that really what indicators are, if you don't know, is statistics. Machine learning and AI could do some of the most brilliant forward-thinking work to help improve well-being by improving statistical modeling. So um, uh, I'm also executive director of a program called the Council on Extended Intelligence that was founded with the MIT Media Lab, great people like Joey Ito. Um, and the other thing too we haven't talked about much here is the bias of where you're based. Most of us in this room are from the West. Ethics in the West is largely about Plato and Socrates and what's called eudaimonia, which is awesome. I'm a big fan. It's flourishing. But if you go to the East, there's Confucius. If you go to the Africa, there's Ubuntu ethics. And in Ubuntu ethics, there's the idea of the gift economy, not the gig economy. But the, the community focus of non-Western traditions often says, can I make sure that your well-being and the environment's well-being, if we want to get non-anthropocentric, meaning not just human-focused and think about the the environment in a holistic way? How can I make sure the earth and others are benefiting more? How can I make sure their well-being is increased before I even think about my own? It's a lovely way to think. So the indicators that exist beyond the SDGs, there's the OECD Better Life Index, Bhutan's Gross National Happiness, they're all numbers that are saying how can we measure people's actual flourishing, long-term physiological, mental, and other aspects of well-being. So long answer except to say, we'd love to get you involved in the work we're doing if you want to 
talked to me after, and it was a fantastic question. And how many, how many countries have signed on to the, the SDGs? I don't know. 189, that 189 many. countries. Okay. Yeah, the SDGs are fantastic. Also, the thing about the SDGs is holistic indicators be careful because some people will say, like, well, this indicator is dangerous because this country in Bhutan, there were human rights issues. Every country has human rights issues, period. Every country is not perfect. But GDP, one thing to remember is what it doesn't measure is things like education, women, uh, caregiving, right? So it's a, such a myopic one focus. These other indicators are saying, let's at least experiment to see what things we should also be measuring. And that they have to be done holistically, not just these three of the SDGs or what have you. Thanks, John. These people are also available. These, these scholars and movers and shakers are available to come to your organization if you feel moved and want to kind of continue this conversation. Sir, thank you for being patient. Your question. Thank you. Great panel. Um, just a comment. I think in terms of impact and bias, we place too much emphasis on the algorithms and explainability. And, and I think that's important for us, for the community developing them. But for the people out there in the world, it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, how many people here can explain how a toilet works? Raise your hand. Maybe one or two. Right? It, so um, I think we're better off if we play more, place more emphasis on the data and the training of the data. So we could regulate the training. And you know, one idea would be to have um, data sets that, are, that the, these algorithms were tested on or, or these systems to make sure there's no bias. So let's say there's a bank you know, that's giving out loans and is using a certain algorithm. And regulators can come and check it every week or randomly with a specific data set, and if the algorithm um, shows a bias, then the license will be taken away. So I think there are alternative ways that are not just focusing on, on, on the techniques and explainability. Thank you. So who in here had questions when you're, when you're using a data set, whether, you know, how it's sourced, just a show of hands. Who of here would like to have more information about the kind of, uh, okay, great, yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Push for that, um, and we can help. Sefi, do you want to respond? Could you hear the well, question? I, I did, and I think it's astute to ask the questions about the training data. Certainly, we need to be thinking about that. And maybe, you know, I would just take it at the, to the next logical step, which is to say uh, it's not just the output of the algorithm and where it's pointed, but might we think about what this algorithm could do to mitigate social inequality or social injustice, which is, a, I think, a little bit different than thinking about optimizing for a bias. For me, it's difficult to imagine a world where there's no bias. The question is, what are we biased toward, and who are we biased against? Um, and that, I think, is a much more complex set of questions, because, of course, even whatever your neutral set is or your, your um, objective neutral standard, thank you, that you're reaching for is still reflective of a position of power uh, in who gets to decide. So I don't think the operation should be to have unbiased algorithms because I don't think it's a realistic objective and I'm not sure that it's worth our time. I think it's much more interesting to think about how are digital technologies um, at multiple layers of development, whether it's in the software and the training and the kind of the machine learning, or whether it's in like the more material element, here's my phone, of thinking about the environmental consequences of this and the labor that's involved, whether it's open miners who are mining uh, minerals that go into microprocessor chips that are necessary for all electronics, all the way through the manufacture and connection process the kind of planned obsolescence that's part of our electronics, and then the e-waste that comes from it, and the people who will have to contend with that, and whose cities, and whose water, and whose lands will be poisoned by the disposal of such. So it's actually a really big environment that we're talking about, and of course, I think training data is part of it, but maybe we might also say, you know, the more we think about automating and um, machine learning and training, the more material resources that actually is tied to in the world. And of course, that's, uh, those labor practices are quite colonial. They're rather neo-colonial. If you study the history of kind of how, um, what's happening in the global south, for example, uh, with respect to how uh, minerals are extracted and waste is disposed of our electronics. 
And I think, again, this gives us a different set of questions about what are we doing and why are we doing it and who is benefiting and who is really going to continue to lose in that process. So those are um, the questions that I think a lot of social scientists are asking right now, including the people on the panel. Thank you. Okay, I want to make sure you both get your questions asked. So can you maybe just each ask and then we'll, I'll have them answer? Yeah, uh, I'll just try to be brief. <clears throat> um, if you can speak so, loud, we can't hear you. Yeah, well. so I'll just try to be brief. Thank you, panelists. Uh, the, all these perspectives are really amazing, and I appreciate them a lot. Um, I just want to ask, we talk a lot of different things that sound like we want you know, unilateral efforts that, to fix some of these problems from changing legislation to changing corporate <laughs> actions and strategies as well as to doing new things that aren't even happening yet. <clears throat> and I'm just curious if I could get even a brief comment from each of the panelists of what do you think is the key strategic thing we should be doing? Should it be focusing on government and social institutions, like putting people into standards organizations, getting new legislators and new regulators in that have these ethical perspectives? Maybe is it in the short term, like getting uh, the private sector to act more responsibly and having people in these AI roles that have sort of a limited and um, very needed skill to push and make responsible actions and diversify their leadership? Or is it to build new um, institutions and have people potentially use that power and leave roles and create new companies and uh, oversight organizations and things? I'm just curious what people think, uh, given the wide breadth of things I've heard. Great question. And so sorry, the person behind you, yes, is your question as well? Um, thank you all. So um, my question is, you know, John mentioned, um, are we driven or uh, did we make our numbers being a key driver um, for private organizations, for governments, et cetera? And um, I know there's a lot we can do with AI for social impact. My question then is, you know, how do we convince these private organizations or governments who are driven by the bottom line, knowing that hiring ML experts is expensive? You guys are expensive. Um, and, you know, data cleaning is time intensive. How do we convince these organizations that they should, you know, put the dollars, put the resources in, even though it might negatively affect their bottom line? Because sometimes, because the planet needs to be saved, because we care about people's well being, that's not what everyone actually is making decisions based upon. And it's sad, but it's true. All right, great questions. Can each of you maybe do a very one minute response? Is that all right? Who wants to start? If you want? I'll try to be very brief. Um, Is it working? Um, so I'll try to be very brief. Um, first, directly to your question, I think we do have to rethink that as a society, what we determine is value added by a corporation. So that actually goes to law, because most corporations by law have to provide value to the uh, stakeholders. So if by law we um, we define what that value can be, right? So if we write in by, by law, the corporation can't do things that are detrimental to society just to give financial value to the stakeholders, then that changes the scenario quite a bit. And then to, in response to the other question in terms of what, a, um, what can be targeted efforts, um, I think it's multi-pronged. I, I don't think it's any one, um, strategy. Um, I think there's education, and that's education of current um, lawmakers, current policymakers, but also education of the people who are coming up who will be the engineers and the developers. And that education, in, you know, for me, really in entails a high um, ethics uh, concentration, like making that uh, a fundamental part of uh, the teaching of engineering and of software development. Um, so, uh, with that out. Very brief comments, if it's all right, because Yo-Yo Ma yeah, is in I the building. I see the two questions are really related. When, sorry? Yo-Yo Ma is in the building, so we got to right. get No, I, I see the two questions are, are really related, and I want to thank you for them both. I would say all action is good action in this, in this no, not necessarily, but in this, in this drive for AI and for social good. Some of us can do political action. You guys can ask the questions around the holistics of your work. Others can do this and that. We just need to do something. And I dare, you know, let's make it happen. Let's do something and hashtag it, making it happen. Let's spread that vibe because I think that's what's needed. And in relation to does it pay? Well, the market rewards what pays. So let's change what pays. Let's change that. I mean, the market was created by people. And when people talk about the market as being emotional and all of that, as if it was a person itself, 
is ridiculous. We can change the market. And trust me, I'm meeting Moody's and the rest of them all the time. We can do it. We should do it. We need to pressure for it. John, final comment? Safia, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're going to have to get off the stage. But final comment? Uh, my comment is I'm a huge fan of Yo-Yo Ma. No, I'm just <laughs> sucking up. Um, I think a question I want to leave you with, too, is why is market the fundamental question that drives humanity and our future? Markets are also a convention and an invention. If you read Adam Smith's second book, it's called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, and it actually reflects what virtue ethicists say around the world. And if you want to compare ethics traditions, virtue ethics is essentially the instantiation of the golden rule, which is not just don't do bad stuff, it's do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The real opportunity for me is, why are we just asking why our machines might be sentient when we aren't also asking, what is it about the values that we want to take to our kids? Anybody here a parent? Look at your kids, and when you get older, look at your kids and think, is everything I'm doing today about helping save the environment, mental health, and other aspects of how my kids will flourish, not just making a profit? Thank you. Okay, so it sounds like today we've learned, we've talked about the importance of calling companies to make sure they're taxed properly, to challenge and problematize the claims of being good and, and trying to hold people to account to make sure that real good is accomplished. You can join the IEEE Standards Initiative if that sounds of interest to you. You can check out books online. Sophia, would you tweet some uh, rec recommended readings or each panelist? Uh, and I think in sum total, this is a vision of the future that we're talking about. This particular get field gets a lot of press in terms of promoting a vision of the future. You help articulate that future. You have a lot of influence in telling this story. So please leave me in thanking this, uh, all of our wonderful panelists and welcome Yo-Yo Ma as well. <laughs>